Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy life. Our studio is here in Anytown, USA. My name is Mark, and on today's show, Spider-Man takes us all to Morton's. Who's joining us, Ashley? <laughs> also here is John Schnepp. That's right. Welcome back. I'm back. I'm happy to be back. <laughs> hey, welcome back to yourself. Welcome, I love that. Welcome to myself back. Because I missed myself being on this show. <laughs> welcome back. Welcome on? back. Hey, welcome back. Also here is Jeremy Johns. I would like to welcome Schnepp back any day. In fact, you're worth you're worth two of me, Schnepp. There's no. going to be two Schnepps here now instead of one me. I'm going back to sleep. And Morton's. <laughs> I'll see Christian Harloff. Hey, Petey, welcome back. I got to tell you, I missed. Hey. The, it's the bit. It's like you in the... You in Joey, the shop, you, were, you know what are you doing? Some, uh, just hanging out a little bit, doing some things, you know. You got some gas. I had some. Uh, do some things. Right. Take care of some business. That's well, fun. it's better than the shit rats. Uh, before <laughs> we get into our first official topic today, I'm not one for announcements, but a lot of you guys have been asking. A lot of people have been wondering. So, I am thrilled to say that the brass here at Complex and Collider have made the very questionable decision of installing me, Mark Ellis, as the new host of Collider Ooh. Movie Talk. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Woo. Please. Take your seats, everybody. Uh, the engine that John Campia built pretty much runs itself, and so I'm very happy to have the keys to this speed wagon and to tell you guys that in the next weeks and months before I inevitably get let go, I would like to have some new segments on here. We're going to have an increased diversity, more opinions on the panel. And look, I know a lot of people out there are wondering, and you may be voicing your concerned opinion, hey, can a comedian run a professional movie news show? That's valid. I have no idea. <laughs> We're about to find out together. One thing I can promise you guys is that that sidebar right there is going to be drinking a whole lot more regularly. <laughs> Do a shot, sidebar. Yeah. What's our first story, Ashley? Sammy Hagar, one of the top two lead singers of Van Halen, recently stated that he's open to a reunion with frontman David Lee Roth in this proposed Why tour. The two would take love? turns belting the hits and a sort of vocal dueling banjos routine. Mark, what do you think about a possible full lineup reunion of the greatest band of all time? This is a real yes. story, and uh, we'll talk about it for a second. Yes, I would totally be up for it. It'd be the best of both worlds. You open with Unchained. You close with Top of the World. As long as Michael Anthony is playing bass again, I am good with both lead singers in Van Halen, though I don't think Roth would ever do it. Anybody want to weigh in? <laughs> I'm totally I love the front fact row. that this is still happening. Yeah. This, is yeah. my, this is my favorite. I, I want to get to Coors Light and Carrots. Yeah. Like, I right. really want to get... And then bet. All right, Dog Pit. Mm -hmm. This is a good show today, See, as long as we stay on it. That's how you run a movie show, is that you put dog pics at the end, so people have to stay around for all the other boring topics, and then you get to cute dog pics. Christian, Halen. <laughs> All uh, right, well, he's a dad. He <laughs> sleeps a lot. John Schnepp, you I'm in for this? Front row tickets, oh. baby. I'm going. It's what amazing. I like to be chimps here. on the side. Ashley Mova? Uh... <laughs> that was her doing her impression of the opening of Jump. All right, let's move on to our first official movie news story here today. Happy birthday, birthday to uh -oh. you. I didn't know that. Happy I didn't know about birthday this. to you. you. Happy birthday, dear Mark Ellis. Not going to do it. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Wow. This is uh, Woo, a an asshole. Baby oh. Karen. Yeah. Baby Karen. Oh, thank you, guys. You know what, Adam? Put up the other sidebar for a second. This would be more fun. Mm. <laughs> that feels good. Thank you guys very much. I had my birthday on Friday, and uh, it feels good to be 67. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Woo. You know you're getting old when they only put three candles on the cake. I forget so, how many there is. Thank you guys very much. That means a lot that anybody even knows my first name here. Thank you all very much. No problem, Jim. Now, <laughs> that's good icing. You got to wear the hat the whole show. Without further ado, what is our first official topic here <laughs> on it's, Collider Movie Talk? It's been two years since the last James Bond movie, Spectre, was released in theaters. And since then, fans have wondered if Daniel Craig would return for a fifth time to play 007 in the untitled Bond 25. Now sources for The Mirror are saying producer Barbara Broccoli has secured Daniel Craig to return for at least one more film. The report states the plan is to begin filming as early as next year in order to hit a proposed release for 2019. This is far from an official confirmation and should be taken as just a rumor for now. Mark, what do you think about the possibility of Daniel Craig returning as Bond? 
Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we should know this is just a rumor, so take this with a massive grain of Himalayan salt. Uh, but I think that Daniel Craig has done enough as James Bond to earn a shot at redemption. And this is the way that his Bonds have gone, because when we first saw him Casino Royale, we're like, holy crap, this could be the best Bond we've ever seen. And then Quantum of Solace came out, and we're all like, well, that was a movie. And then Skyfall came out, and we're like, yeah, see, that's the guy. That's the guy we were talking about. And then Spectre is a movie that I know divided some fans. I was very let down by Spectre, and I honestly felt like Daniel Craig didn't really give it all that he could have had in that, or maybe the script just didn't allow him to be his best Bond. So, Christian, I think that Daniel Craig has done enough for me to become Bond again. I wouldn't blink an eye either way, though. Like, I wouldn't be upset if they said, oh, Daniel Craig is done, now we have this new person coming in. But also, if they said Daniel Craig's coming back, I would say this is not Daniel Craig just grabbing a paycheck. This is him trying to seal his fate as one of the better Bonds we've ever had. I know this is a rumor right now, but I think all signs lead up that he's coming back. I think that if you look at even a year ago, how vocal he was with where he said he wasn't coming back, and he was making a point to say he wasn't going to come back, and was clearly negotiating tactics. That's what he was doing. Doing, and it looks like those tactics have worked and the conversations have gotten more realistic and that's why these reports are coming out. Now, whether or not like, this site is reported on stuff that hasn't happened, but I think that it looks like we are going to see him back at least one more time as Bond. Now, we don't know who the director is going to be. We don't know any of that stuff yet. But I think, yeah, if you can get him back for another one to kind of continue on this, he's been a good Bond. Now, I, I know that we've talked about it beforehand, and I felt like if he was going to complain about it, and he was going to be like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. They don't do it anymore. Like, I, as a fan, it's like, give me someone who wants to do it. But if he wants to do it again, and he's getting back into it, and it was just negotiating tactics. I wish they would keep that kind of stuff sometimes behind closed doors and don't get us involved because that's kind of like, well, you know, I'm a, I don't care, but I do, but I don't. It's like, just do it or don't. <laughs> and I think that that's going to happen. I think he's going to play Bond, and we'll figure out who the director I is. I mean, regardless of whether he comes back or not, when they initially talked about Craig being in negotiations to come back, they were kicking around some serious cheddar. I mean, that guy was going to be making James Harden money if he came back to be another Bond. I don't think he's worth $50 million or even 25 or $20 million to come back and be Bond, because I think you can get a new Bond at a much cheaper price and then put the rest of that money into some sort of production budget. Jeremy, do you want to see Daniel Craig return one more time? Yeah, I'd like to see him return one more time, because, I mean, the pattern is the first one was great, second one, no, third one was great, uh, fourth one, no. So the fifth one mathematically <laughs> right. should be great, right? So I'd love to see him return. Um, ever since we got Ray Fiennes as M, I wanted to see, like, all right, these two, let's see what they do. And I never really got to see what they did. I feel like studios do this thing that you hate just to see what the, the fan chatter is. Like, if fans really go, oh, my gosh, we want to see that, then they'll be like, oh, obviously they want to see that. But if fans are like, eh, kind of indifferent, then now yeah. they know. I don't know how much weight it actually has, but I feel like that's the only reason they would do that. Because sometimes they test it for sure, but yeah. I think this was more of him being vocal. Mm -hmm. I said sometimes when the actors do it, it feels a little bit like, you know, <laughs> love me! Yeah. Right, right. I, I totally get it. <laughs> I, I mean, whether or not he comes back, he's my favorite James Bond, honestly. Like, And, and when... Casino Royale came out and I said that there was this big like <laughs> on MySpace where I was like yeah, yeah, yeah you know I, I, what, I don't know what to say I like him better than even Connery and so I think he's proven that he is definitely one of the top two Bonds so if he comes back I think that's great if they get someone else it, it's, I'm not going to compromise my Bond experience. John Schnapp, who should be Bond in Bond 25? George Lazenby. Yeah. yeah. I thought he was your favorite Bond. Uh, he is my third favorite Bond. Right. Well, you know what? I was I was going to say the same kind of, you know, even odd, even odd for some strange reason. It's the, uh, the odd ones for Bond, so the fifth one should be good. Right. But I'm also going to say with Christian, like, he was openly complaining and just saying, I'm sick of doing this role. I mean, if you go back and just go back a year and, like, read all the, like, Stuff that he was saying about being playing James Bond, he's tired of it, he doesn't want to do it, it's boring. I mean, that made me turn negative on him. I was like, well, then don't play it anymore. It doesn't matter if they're willing to pay you $100 million for two more movies. I mean, come on. I mean, you've got a, a career as an actor doing all these other films. Do I want to see him do another Bond to redeem the Spectre horror that I saw? Yes, I, I, th I think he's a great James Bond. I'd like him to return to the Casino Royale James Bond. So I think if we get that chance with the fifth one, I'm in. Uh, is there anybody that you guys can think of right now that you think should be replacing Daniel Craig as James Bond? We want to hear from you guys, too. I'm seeing everybody in the chat room from, like, a James McAvoy to an Idris Elba to a Gal Gadot. Shemp, who do you think could be the next Bond if Daniel Craig does not want to do it? Well, I mean, I, I used to think Tom Hiddleston, so yeah. I still, I'm just going to go with that. 
I think he'd be if, great. If you go a little older, I still think you could try to do um, Clive Owen. I think that would have been interesting. But yeah, Tom Hiddleston is one for sure. Henry Cavill could be somebody. Uh, Idris Elba. And I, I think that the suggestion for Gal Gadot was one of the Bond girls. No, she's think. playing Bond, damn it. Ba- Bond she's girl. Playing Bond. I, I would love to see Gal Gadot as a Bond girl. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, Jeremy Johns, you have the final say on who should be James Bond. You know I'm not good at this. Like, think of something <laughs> on the top of your head shit. Um, Patrick Stewart. I think he would be great. <laughs> Patrick Stewart, like, oh, fuck you, Blofeld. And then he's just like, kill him. Just like make Patrick Stewart a killer. If we can get Patrick Stewart away from voicing turds in emoji movies, maybe he can be James Bond <laughs> he, once again. He's the shit emoji, isn't he? He is he the is. turd emoji. Moving on. What's our next story, Ash? According to a report from Variety, composer John Williams, who has scored all but two of Steven Spielberg's feature films over the past 43 years, will not be doing the music composition for Ready Player One. Instead, Back to the Future and the Avengers composer, Alan Silvestri, will take on the project. The report states that because post-production is happening at the same time on both Ready Player One and Spielberg's other film, The Papers, Williams will score The Papers with Silvestri stepping in on Ready Player One. With the papers, Williams will now have scored 28 feature films directed by Spielberg. The papers opens in theaters on December 22nd later this year, with Ready Player One opening on March 30th, 2018. Christian, what do you think about Alan Silvestri scoring Ready Player One instead of John Williams? I mean, look, when you when you hear about John Williams not doing anything, of course you go, oh, man, I wonder what that would have sounded like. It's John Williams. But don't scoff at Alan Silvestri, Predator. Young Guns 1 and 2, good yeah. ones. Back to the Future, the Avengers theme. I mean, and and so much. I mean, at Forrest Gump, there's so much that he has done. Memorable, memorable scores. But it's just when you, the all-time, the Muhammad Ali of scores is John Williams. So you're going to want him to do it. But I think that, and some people, oh, I wish this was reversed, and I understand that. But I still think I'm very excited to hear what Alan Silvestri can do. And as far as, you know, John Williams doing the other one, okay, great. Anything that John Williams does, I want to hear it, no matter what it is. It's like, oh, he's doing the score for a 7-Eleven commercial. Can't wait to hear it. Um, but Alan Silvestri, I'm glad he's getting this opportunity and I'm sure Spielberg's obviously very familiar with him, has done stuff with him in the past, because Zemeckis and Spielberg have a relationship, and Zemeckis did a bunch of stuff for, uh, I mean, obviously Spielberg produced Back to the Future, so he's very familiar with Silvestri. He probably made the call, and I think it's great. I, I can't wait to hear what Silvestri's going to do. I uh, do not want to see John Williams score a 7-Eleven commercial. I think that'd be really, really sad. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> they, or amazing. That's, that's the only work he could book is, hey, I got a 7-Eleven spot. Ken Napsack would say otherwise. Ken Napsack would say a lot of things about John Williams and Alan Silvestri. And Jeremy, you look at two of the all-time great composers that we've ever had in the history of cinema. What Christian said, it's not, it's not a bad thing that these guys are still working on movies. I would like to see John Williams. I think that this is actually the better play because Alan Silvestri's scores have so much feeling and pace to them. And I think that might serve a video game-centric movie like Ready Player One better. So if I had, Williams would be great at both of them. Silvestri would be great at both of them. If I had to pick one and plug them into these holes, I would say Silvestri should do Ready Player One. And John Williams is the better choice for the papers. How do you see it? Yeah, I think that either of them would be good for Ready Player One. They'd be perfect for Ready Player One, but Silvestri would be better for Ready Player One than he would the papers, yeah. if I could phrase it that way. And uh, I love the fact that Christian <laughs> rattled off the uh, the filmography of uh, Silvestri, because it can't be understated. It's not like we're getting... You know, some kid straight out of college who's now going to... De- like, this guy had... I mean, like you said, Forrest Gump, uh, Back to the Future, for a long time in my life, I thought Back to the Future was done by John Williams. And then Napster <laughs> came out, and I was like, oh, I guess not. You know, <laughs> you see who does it right there. So, I mean, he does have that same style, same feel, that same uh, flavor for fun. It is a tough call, though, because... It's a tough spot that it was in because these are two Spielberg uh, films. Usually, usually, Williams does the Spielberg movie, but they can't do both. So uh-huh. you're, for, you're forced to split it, and in terms of the split, I think this is, this is good parent. That's right, Schnepp. So you have Ready Player One now being done by Silvestri, and then Williams doing the papers. Is that the right call? You know, ultimately, it's uh, it's Spielberg and, and all of the production uh, assistants there who are just, who are making these decisions. I think uh, Silvestri would have done a better job with the paper. I think than Ready Player One. I wanted a, something memorable for Ready Player One, and to me, John Williams, along with Howard Shore, Hans Zimmer, that's that's that camp. And then Alan Silvestri is in the a slightly a slightly second tiered camp. I mean, you're talking about the film composers, the best film composers of all time. So you, you have Jerry Goldsmith. You have a lot of different people. Tyler Bates. You but they're not in the same. Sylvester in there, huh? Not to Forrest me. Forrest Gump, Back to the Future. No. No. 
Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just say, saying. I no, mean, but I'm talking about of all time. You got like you know top ten. You know he's in the the top two of like all time. So I mean, like we'll have to make a show about the top ten. You know, <laughs> <or the> musical <laughs> score composers, so you guys can figure out who we're talking about. But uh, I personally w was looking forward to John Williams' score for Ready Player One. I'm not saying that Alan Silvestri's themes for the Avengers or anything like that aren't great and amazing and memorable, but they're just not as memorable. I can I can hum like 30 John Williams scores off oh, the top of, of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, I think if you take John Williams' movie scores and his his history out of it. Alan Silvestri to me is is one of the more recognizable. You just hear a score and you're like, oh, that's Alan Silvestri. I mean, Back to the Future is a huge, that's his walk-off grand slam. Mm -hmm. But don't, I'm telling you, you guys know I love Young Guns too. Do not sell that score as short. He did a good job with Young Guns. Yeah. The second one, that score really takes you over. The Bon Jovi song is great. Alan Silvestri is one of the main reasons why Young Guns 2 is a great movie Predator, to man. this day. Predator is <laughs> awesome. Predator is really good. You know what's funny is that we're talking about, oh, this composer should do this movie. Same guy's directing both of them. Yeah, Same right. guy's right. directing both <laughs> movies. So tip of the cap, Mr. Spielberg. Use whatever composer you want. Just make sure it's good and memorable, as we're pretty sure you will. All right. This is now time for the weekend box office. A lot of things went down, and there's some web fluid all over this weekend. Ashley, how gooey did it get? <laughs> Well, it's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report, and it's official, Spidey is home. Sony and Marvel's co-production proved to be a massive hit with the second reboot, Spider-Man Homecoming, taking the number one spot and opening well above expectations with $117 million. The opening stands as the second largest ever for a Spider-Man feature and is the largest opening for a single character intro in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Universal and Illumination's Despicable Me 3 took the number two spot with an estimated 34 million, bringing its domestic total just shy of 150 million. Sony's Baby Driver took the number three spot in its second weekend, finishing with an estimated 12.75 million and a domestic total of 56.9 million. Wonder Woman continues to impress, taking the number four spot with an estimated 10.1 million, with a domestic total now just shy of 370 million, making it the 10th largest superhero release domestically of all time. And rounding out the top five was Paramount's Transformers The Last Night. The movie dropped 60% in its third weekend, delivering an estimated estimated 6.3 million as its domestic total comes in just shy of 120 million. Jeremy, thoughts on Spider-Man Homecoming's huge opening this weekend? That was a huge opening week. Any huge opening weekend that leaves that much gooey web fluid on my eager face, that is a good time at oh the box gosh. office. I really uh. love Spider-Man Homecoming a lot. I love the fact that it made that much. I wanted it to beat the, the first Raimi Spider-Man box office opening, and it did, because I count this as a first installment, not the eight Spider-Man movie or whatever it's supposed to be. I think it's the six at this point. Uh, so I, I love that it made that much. I, I think it would have made more had, uh, had people not had the Spider-Man fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they did, and it's just a, it's a fact of life. The fact that it made that much, even with that Spider-Man fatigue that you hear in the chatter online, I think that's great. Uh, 3D, I'm sure, probably helped it out. Uh, the fact that Wonder Woman's still holding on in the double digits is really impressive. And the fact that... You guys told Transformers we've had enough. I think that's impressive, too. I love the fact that Baby Driver's making money, too. So mm. all in all, pretty solid weekend. That's right. But before we get to PD and his web goo, we also have Baby Driver uh, only dropped 38%. And so it's still pulled in $12 million. It's made its budget back well over the $34 million it cost to put that movie out. The only movie that came out in, or that was in release this weekend that made less of a percentage drop than Baby Driver, Wonder Woman, 35% drop. So that movie keeps on chugling. And, Schnepp, when you look at Spider-Man, is it, is it odd to say that you look at $117 million and you say, ah, okay, because it, it was the third biggest opening of the year. So you had Beauty and the Beast at almost $200 million. You had Guardians of the Galaxy. And then Spider-Man, that's a great, great reboot franchise opening for a first movie. But is there some weird way that we expected it to do better than 117? Uh, maybe some people did, some people didn't. I think because it's the third reboot in such a recent amount of time, there was that fatigue that you're talking about. Even though all the people who, who loved Captain America Civil War and saw that return of Spider-Man couldn't wait to see this new Spider-Man, I think the amazing Spider-Man 2 kind of tainted that for a lot of people, including me, even though you know I was like, well, I like the Civil War, but I don't know what Sony's going to do with Spider-Man. But now that I've seen the film and saw that the perfect merging of what Marvel, the cinematic universe, and the Spider-Man universe are merged together now. I can't wait to see all, all the rest of the films, knowing that Spider-Man is going to be part of it. I think that's the perfect 
perfect way to put it as far as what Sony did. The real smart play to bring Spider-Man into the Marvel Cinematic Universe and a way to keep their own property. So, I mean, for myself, $117 million I think is perfect. I mean... The one thing I did want to mention about Transformers is at San Diego Comic Con, I think it's Thursday night, I'm going to go see it drunk. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, anybody who's going to be at San Diego Comic Con, late night screening of Transformers 3D with my dumb ass, drunk, we're going to go. There's no way you're going to make that. Oh, yeah. You're going to be at the parties. There's, I, I will bet a hefty wager. You right, no man, way you make that. Christian just talked some sense into me. After, <laughs> after, I know, just, Christian just ruined Such it for everybody. Conviction. Yeah, zero no conviction. He's right. There's everybody shows be up. Wait, where's Schnepp? I know. Like, he's he's just so sick. Some party. Yeah, that, yeah, that would suck. Honestly, the way to do it would be to do it in the morning. I know you shouldn't drink before 11 a.m., according to my doctor, but if you do that in the morning, <laughs> then you're not going to fall asleep because if you're doing all day at Comic Con, right. then you go see Transformers and you're doing a drinking game, you're going to be out yeah. by hour one. Yeah. All right. I Take it back. I lied. <laughs> you know what? I've been wanting to do this for a long time. We will get it on the book. Yeah, let's do it. At some point. Just here in L.A. Not. We'll do it we'll, here. We'll, we'll do it here in L.A. Now, Christian, I want to get your take on the box office, but I want to ask you, because you seem to have strong opinions about this, why Spider-Man is a much more known character, even in today's modern age, than the Guardians of the Galaxy, yet that movie did a lot better. Yeah. Its sequel did opening weekend. Why do you think that is? Oh, it's 100%. It's the fatigue, but it's not the fatigue, maybe so for some of the people who are, were looking forward to the movie, or maybe hardcore fans it was the fatigue of the casual audience that's really what it was because uh, remember not everybody is as tuned in as all of us when it comes to what's going on with spider-man and where he lies now in the mcu all they hear is another spider-man movie oh great we're gonna hear about uncle ben again we're gonna do this again oh who's this kid i don't care a lot of people that i talked to that didn't know it was coming out like someone asked me the other day people just came over to my place and my friends of my of my wife are these and I, the people you always accost when they come home no these are new these are new people and my <laughs> but friends of uh, of my wife and i'm talking and they're like well what movies are out there spider-man like really another one and i was like no this is different i had to explain to them wow. what it was and and that keeps happening and i understand that but 117 million dollars is a great number it's not just a eh, it's a great number yeah. and it's a really i mean you hear Spider-Man, you just assume it's going to make two hundred million or close right. to it. But one hundred and seventeen million dollars, what it will do, and the reason why Guardians Two did better is because the first Guardians was unexpected. It crushed in August, did really well, established itself as a franchise that people wanted to see. Spider-Man now will have a very good sequel opening. It'll do better than one hundred and seventeen million because the people that had the fatigue will will you know the casual audience will give it a shot. We'll see it, and word of mouth will, will help as well. But I think that. Even though Transformers is still making money overseas, um, $120 million in the States for that movie is not good. That is, that's bad. That, that is real bad. I don't care. I know you're just going international. You're trying to get international office, but I mean, box office, but my God. Yeah, $500 million, just oh. shy of $500 oh, but, million dollars but, worldwide. Yeah, but. but Baby Driver, I'm glad. It's, it's mm -hmm. So far, that's the one I'm really excited that's making the money. And I don't know what is more exciting to me, the fact that that movie, Baby Driver, is doing as well as it is, or the fact that my mother-in-law, my 70-some-year-old mother-in-law saw it and said, that baby driver was something else. She loved it, but uh, but she's oh um, and my, my and yes, my my mother-in-law is Emo Phillips. Right? I saw I saw a Baby Driver this weekend in Texas, and it was sold out. We had to go back. We had to go to see a matinee the next day because it was jam packed. This this just this past weekend. The music, yeah. everything, so good. <laughs> well, I'm good. Pat enjoyed it. I also saw Baby Driver <laughs> while I was in Texas, and uh, it's a damn good time. I wonder if there's something to be said for that first May weekend when it comes to summer movies or comic book because that's what Guardians had. I just wonder maybe if the roles were reversed. If Spider-Man was the movie that was coming out the first weekend in May when we're kicking off this summer, I wonder if that's the movie that does about $140 million and then Guardians in the mix of the summer does maybe around 115, 120. But either way, huge opening for Spider-Man Homecoming. <laughs> Cody Hall is taking us all out to lunch today. And now we move on to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley's going to give us a topic and we simply say, Roth or Hagar, what's up first? <laughs> According to a report from the tracking board, Fresh Off the Boat star Randall Park is set to play S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Jimmy Woo in Marvel's Ant-Man and the Wasp. Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly will return to play the title characters and will be joined by Black Mirror actress Hannah John Kamen, whose role remains a mystery. Michael Douglas and Michael Pena are also expected to return, with Peyton Reed returning to direct. The movie begins filming soon, with Disney and Marvel setting the release for July 6, 2018. Schnapp Byersall, Randall Park as S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Jimmy Woo in Marvel's Ant-Man and the Wasp. 
I'm going to buy it. I wonder if he's going to play uh, the character in a flashback sequence with Michael Douglas. So that's kind of made me starting to think about, oh, Ant-Man and the Wasp, if they're going to have the original team and show a little adventure of that original team with the early S.H.I.E.L.D. with him playing that character. So I wonder if that's going to happen. So, yeah, I'm excited to see what they do with Yeah, this. I was on the same page as you because Ant-Man is one of those movies that really took a, a little step forward with the, uh, the, the, the technology that you can make somebody look younger. Michael Douglas's appearance was flawless in that earlier scene that we got of Mr. Pimp. So seeing, I mean, Randall Park is a guy who, like, I didn't know his name, but as soon as I saw a picture of him, I was like, oh, yeah, I like that dude and everything I see him in. So I think he's going to be a credit to the Marvel cinematic universe and it's nice getting shield a little bit more involved in the history of what ant-man and now the wasp by proxy have to offer so jeremy your take on this it's got two buys already uh, yeah, well i'll give it a halen for sure i think it's uh, i'm with you on it when i heard his name i was like who is that so while we're talking about it on imdb i'm like ah, oh, kim jong-un from the interview i thought you know he's great and mm -hmm. then you see him in smaller roles i think he's great too one thing that we do or at least like not we but you know everybody on the internet there's always a story that breaks, like this actor's going to be in this thing, and then you find out it's a cameo of some sort. So he might be a cameo. <laughs> like He might not even have a huge role. Um, I think he has the, the timing to really fit into that universe, especially in an Ant-Man movie. So, yeah. Halen. He's great on Veep, too. Christian? This kind of seems like typical MCU casting. Remember, they, they like to cast TV comedic uh, actors in, in S.H.I.E.L.D. roles. You know, Kobe Smulders was the other one, so now you have, mm -hmm. now you have him t doing it. I think that he's really good, and I think that it fits the Ant-Man tone, his kind of humor, because you've also seen him in different movies throughout. Where I mean, because he was also in Trainwreck, where he there's certain things he can do. He can be over the top when he needs to be over the top, like Jeremy was talking about with the interview. He could be there. There's times where he can be serious. It's just I think he's, he's the guy that can be the perfect blend because Ant Man to me was a was a blend of the humor and sometimes it was a little. It was going for the over comedic, and I think he fits in well. Um, as long as it just doesn't turn into an overall comedy show and uses the humor the way that like Spider Man did and and Ant Man, the first Ant Man, I think that he's a perfect cast for it. Yeah, Ant Man, a lot of great comedy in there though, and like so Ant Man of the Wasp. Hopefully we get more of that. I mean, I love the action elements that we have, and I think Peyton Reed did a marvelous job, but I want last. I want, like, those Baskin-Robbins moments that we got <laughs> out of the first Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp, and I think Randall Park might be able to facilitate that. Uh, what's our next story, Ash? Magnolia Pictures has debuted the official trailer for Lucky, starring Harry Dean Stanton. The film, billed as a love letter to the life and career of Harry Dean Stanton, follows the spiritual journey of a 90-year-old atheist Lucky, played by Stanton, and the quick quirky characters that inhabit his off-the-map desert town. Lucky finds himself thrust into a journey of self-exploration, co-starring Ron Livingston, Ed Begley Jr., Beth Grant, and David Lynch. The movie marks the directorial debut of John Carroll Lynch, scoring very good reviews out of its South by Southwest premiere, as well as Oscar buzz for Stanton. The movie debuts in theaters on September 29th. Mark Byers saw the first trailer for Lucky, starring Harry Dean Stanton and David Lynch. It's a big buy for me. It's got that nice Oscar-friendly release date, and then after seeing the trailer, Harry Dean Stanton looks marvelous in this. The entire cast looks great, and I'm excited for John Carroll Lynch directing the movie, but I see this trailer, and I instantly got shades of Nebraska, which had similar award-caliber performances from Bruce Dern. Harry Dean Stanton in this, it's it, following this guy named Lucky and seeing everything he goes through. It's a smaller movie, it's a quieter movie, but Schnapp, I think that John Carroll Lynch is a guy, as a director, who can probably get into those quiet comedic moments that aren't necessarily laugh out loud gut busting humor but you really enjoy watching the ride and the journey that this 90 year old has been on and is going on in this particular movie smaller flick for sure but y'all should watch the trailer for lucky big buy for me how about you yeah big buy for me uh i love the actor the actor john carroll lynch i think he's been in a lot, a lot of incredible films uh most recently check out the invitation that's on netflix i mean he's just a great character actor uh from the trailer, it looks like he's got a, a, a smash hit as far as independent film. He got a great cast, Harry Dean Stanton. This looks like a return to something similar to Paris, Texas for him, like a, a one-man show yeah. type of a thing where it's like but with a, a lot of uh, good supporting roles. You got David Lynch. You got a whole bunch of different supporting, uh, uh, you know, good character actors. It just felt like a real film, and I like the return to going to see a real movie. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, Jeremy, we got a guy from Twin Peaks in the lead. What do you say? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I've always liked uh, Harry Dean Stanton. I've always liked him, and I love the fact that in a world where a lot of young people are cast in movies, you can have this movie that's like, here's a really old dude 
who gets his time to shine. I just think that's a sweet thing. You know, he just looked like, you know, he's like a little dude. And then you see the praises on the trailer. We're like, this dude totally knocks it out of the park. I feel like after watching this trailer, you have to be such a jaded prick to not at least smile and be like, oh, that's sweet. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's impossible. You know, so, yeah, buy from me. Halen. I want to see that on the poster. You have to be a jaded prick to not smile at this movie. Lucky. Christian, what do you got? Uh, Schnapp, I'm coming to you on this. My favorite Henry Dean Stanton line from any movie. Avenge me, boys! Avenge me! Oh my goodness. I'm going to go Red Dawn. Nice. It is. Yeah, is it wow, really? Absolutely. Oh, dude, Red I, Dawn. That was, that was that, a half that's, joke. That's why I, I suck at the trivia showdown. Yeah, John Millis. I've seen Red Dawn. I just don't yeah. remember those things. Mm -hmm. uh, I buy this movie. I absolutely buy this movie. I think that for Stanton to do this role, I think this is absolutely something that is you were going to hear about. I'll, just looking at the trailer, I can say even it's going to be something, even the movie wasn't very good. Like something like where Monster, when Monster came out, people were like, yeah, the movie's okay, but the performance by Charlize Theron right. was the one that stood out. Now, I don't know if this is the case with this. I'm just saying this seems like that kind of movie to where the, the performance already in the trailer was powerful enough that we're going to be hearing a lot out of it. And the South by Southwest buzz now that he really put some stuff out there. And, and we also, the Academy, we know that the Academy likes to honor if somebody can really hit something at an older age, like uh, when Christopher Plummer did it for Beginners, and now if Henry Dean Stanton now can do it for this movie for Lucky, whether or not he wins is another thing, but... I think you're going to hear about him. I mean, look, Stallone. Stallone's another one. Not as old, you know. Not, Stallone was, what, in his late 70s when he got the Creed nom, or early 70s, excuse me, when he got the Creed nom, and then Stanton now at, what, 90 years old? Mm -hmm. It's pretty crazy. That's that's amazing. Two buys on the panel. One, Halen and Christian likes the guy from Red Dawn, so we're very oh, excited man. about Lucky. Before we move on to Mailbag, I also want to remind you guys, at the end of this show, we're going to be taking your live Twitter questions. Wendy is our beloved gatekeeper. Let's go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video, and we have a lot lot of shows right now you can check out on Collider Video TV Talk starring Josh McCoogan. Company is going to be up later on today. We also have our newer show, Comic Book Shopping. That guy right there. Go shopping with Lincoln Park. That's the latest episode. It is up on the channel right now. And speaking of comic book news on the Collider Video channel, we go to John Schnepp for a breaking story. That's right. Collider Heroes is daily starting this week. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Myself, uh, Robert Meyer Burnett and Amy Dallin will be on, and we're going to be talking about all the different news from comic books, comic book movies, comic book television shows. We're going to run the gamut, and so please join us. It's every day. Probably it's going to go up around a little after 1 o'clock today and uh, every day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday following. So please join us. Yeah, there's like the little like the special episodes. They're going to be yeah. like, like, like 15, 20-minute episodes. Right? Yeah, they're not yeah. going to be like, we're not doing the hour and a half long one episode. We're going to do like special smaller, nuggets. yeah, little nuggets for you guys. Mm, tasty morsels of delicious, sweaty heroes goodness. <laughs> Speaking of goodness, Christian, you have been playing a lot of video games I've noticed this weekend. Is that trend going to continue? It is. I got thrown in this some stuff when Jeremy and I went to um, EA Play yeah. and we started playing Battlefront and I didn't even really know the camera was on me and I started playing it and people were like, oh, I want to see Harloff be terrible at games again. So I did it with the <laughs> Spider-Man game, the virtual reality stuff that, and I, and I played it over the weekend. They put that up there and so people are like, let's let's do more. So we're actually going to, we're going to start doing some more gaming stuff, but so you, you have a little bit more of the information what we're doing today, right? That's right. Later on today, Christian and uh, our good buddy, comedian Rick Ingram, if you, if you don't know Rick, he's one of the funniest humans I've ever met in my entire life. We started the comedy store together. He's hysterical, and he, like Christian, is going to be playing games later on today on Xbox Live. You can play Battlefield 1 with them. Use the gamer the, the gamer tag Complex1271. They're going to send out the party invites to random fans to play along, so make sure yeah. you're on Xbox Live and you check out Complex1271 every 30 minutes. They're going to change the fan they play with, so a lot of lucky fans are going to get to probably beat you guys. Oh, they're going to kill me, but I think that's that was the idea behind it, is that we figured to extend the invite to all the Collider fans who have been so supportive and everything too. Let's just let's just have fun. Only people inside of this uh, game will be myself and Collider fans. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. That's right. We also have new behind the scenes and bloopers that came out this weekend, as well as our weekend mailbag shows. Check out the Saturday and Sunday editions right now. And last but not least, Jeremy, we're getting to your show now. An all new awesome tacular came out this past Friday. You guys can check out the link in this vid's description. You sir are awesome tacular. Do the camera punch thing. <sighs> There. <laughs> I trained you so well. Now we move on to mailbag. Ashley Mova has a letter that somebody wrote us. You guys can email us anytime. Collidervideo at gmail.com. And we'll either answer it on Movie Talk or on the weekend mailbag shows. What do we got today? 
Jim Casey writes, hello, Collider crew. I just saw Spider-Man this weekend and loved it. I do have a question, though. It seems after watching the movie that Marvel really tightly tied in Spider-Man into the MCU. What happens if after Homecoming 2, Sony and Marvel decide not to continue the deal? For Marvel, it seems easy. They just don't put him in any more MCU movies. For Sony, how would they unravel Spider-Man out of the MCU without having to do yet another reboot? Or since it's so successful, do you think Sony and Marvel keep their deal for a long while? Thanks, and keep up the great work. It's a great question, Jim, and I think that after a $117 million opening weekend, both the MCU and Sony would probably want to keep playing ball together. And let's not say this is a slam dunk for the MCU where they're like, oh, they don't need Spider-Man. They can just get rid of him anytime they want. You got the Infinity War movie, and then you have another movie starring the Avengers after that. We don't know what the fallout of that is. We don't know how many of the characters that we love right now are going to be in movies going forward or go into retirement or continue to headline their own standalone movies. So I think it makes a lot of sense. It behooves Marvel as well as Sony to keep Spider-Man in the MCU for as long as humanly possible. And Schnepp, if there was some sort of thing that happened where uh, the MC or Sony decided we don't want Spider-Man in your current world anymore, so you had to unpackage that, do you think they go with a straight reboot or they can continue to make these Spider-Man movies and just have like weird, awkward jokes like, oh, remember that thing I did with those guys that don't exist anymore? Yeah, now we're moving on to something else. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't see that happening. I don't even think they would do something like that. If it feels like, you know, as we found out more and more about the deal, like from Feige and Pascal, as they drop more information as people are like, well, what's going on with Venom? What's what are these standalone movies? Is Spider-Man going to be in it? What about the rest of the MCU? It's, it makes total sense that, yeah, Spider-Man, whatever Homecoming 2 or whatever they're going to end up calling it, comes out directly after the fourth Avengers film. So that's going to that's going to open up the phase four universe. And that's what Feige said. So they're obviously making Spider-Man a giant part of the MCU. All the other Sony films like Venom, uh, Silver and Black, whatever they're going to make, keep making, you know, are, it's going to have Spider-Man in it, but it's not going to have the rest of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But that's OK, because look at Netflix and Daredevil and, you know, they they make sometimes they make little asides and little notes. But otherwise, they you could say they live in their own pocket universe. So whether or not they separate it or not, I think they made a deal where they can keep Tom Holland around for as long as they want. And that's not going to affect the MCU. And I think it makes sense for them to play play ball, so to speak. You know, I think it's working out great. I hope it keeps working right now. Uh, Kid Dynamite, we saw that, you know, Amy Pascal and Kevin Feige might not always have been on the same page when it comes to giving interviews about the future of Spider-Man or what the current involvement of his standalone movies might be in the MCU. But then you go see Spider-Man Homecoming this weekend, and it just felt like such a great marriage of this independent-ish character into the MCU, so you'd think they'd want to keep that running. Yeah, they're I mean, they're going to keep it running for as long as the contract says, and after that, they'll, they'll renegotiate the contract and proceed accordingly. I don't think there's any fear of tomorrow. Spider-Man's no longer in the MCU, but if we want to have fun and play Elseworld hypothesis because comic books and, hey, maybe there's an alternate universe where this does happen, I feel like they'll just press on and just never mention it like mm. oh norman osborne's causing problems i'm the only hero around <laughs> i gotta take care of it and there's, there's not gonna be a oh after the avengers died in a bus fire and now i'm in a <laughs> another universe it's not gonna be like that they're, they're going to press on like jeremy john's going through a breakup put your head in the sand ignore the phone calls ignore the emails and proceed like a proper man child it'll be fine uh we're all rooting for you buddy it would be interesting to see spider-man in a standalone movie after he's done with the mcu and it's just like witness protection program like, he can't talk about his past at all. He's got a totally changed bio. Christian, is that the potential future, or do you think we're going to have Spidey in the MCU for a good period? Here? Uh, look, I think Sony is in a no-win situation right now because this movie made a lot of money. It did really well. It, it really brought Spider-Man back to where I think it's the best Spider-Man movie, obviously, since Spider-Man 2 with the Raimi version. So I think that, and, and it's the first time we've ever had Spider-Man really locked into the MCU. Obviously, Civil War, but you know what I mean, like the longer story. And what Marvel now can say, I mean, and whether the perception from a lot of fans is, well, once they linked in with Marvel, the company that obviously knows them, it, it, they revitalize the character. The character's back. We have the character. So if they split from Marvel at this point, it's all eyes are going to be on them, especially if the movies are making money. Now, if Marvel just decides that they don't want to do it anymore or if it comes down to five, ten years, whenever the deal ends, and it's this crazy negotiation because there's going to be negotiation once the deal runs out, it's going to be like this thing we were just talking about with Craig. It's going to be, 
lobbying of whose side are the fans on because we see what marvel has done since spider-man locked in we see what happened in when he was on in infinity war and what happened after spider-man 2 if they can make all those successful sony's got to make sure that they kind of I, I think stay with marvel as long as they can but it needs to be cordial and they don't want to get screwed they want to make sure that it, it's it's a fair deal all the way around but it, it makes the most sense to keep them in there as long as you can i got to go back to your neighbors your wife's friends or your dearly beloved mother-in-law where you say what? that a lot of people may not even know that this rift happens or goes on if there is a split and so spider-man let's say he's in a standalone movie and he's away from the mcu and it doesn't take place i think most people who are Spider-Man just casual fans out there may not know or may not care because now they have known this character for two movies. And yeah, like for us, I think it'd be it'd be a step down if we all of a sudden didn't get to see some other cool Marvel characters who had this tie into a greater universe. But I still think that Sony is capable of making a good Spider-Man going forward. I just think it really helps if he's tied into the it, MCU. It does. But my point is the fact that once you because right now they've just established him in this new standalone movie, and we know that we're getting him in. Avengers, which is going to be make a lot of money, and a lot of people, those casual fans, will see it because it's Avengers. He's starting to get more and more associated with the MCU. So right now, he's only got Civil War and a standalone. But after the Avengers Part One, Part Two, Spider Man Two, with other Marvel characters, then the fans, the casual fans, are going to be are going to be very used to the fact that he's part of it. So it's going to be even harder for them to let go of it. Why would they though? I mean, because the way the deal works, Venom is now going to have Tom Holland as Spider-Man in it. That's only going to be helpful that's for that, Sony. That's not, but that's... No, no that's, that's the agreement. That's the agreement? Yeah. Is gonna have? The agreement is Spider-Man can be in all those Sony spinoffs. It's just not part of the MCU, meaning that Iron Man and Captain America... No, see, there's so many different reports. Though. That's the, the way I yeah, understand th it. There's a lot of contractual unpacking that has not been made public yet that you still have to sort out when you come to a Venom standalone movie. And I know that there's been a lot of speculation back and forth, and our own Steve Frosty Weintraub had a really interesting interview with Tom Holland where we kind of got updates, but I don't think anything has been solidified yet. Yeah. And I think that, that, that it's it, it's perfectly natural for two huge companies like Sony and MCU to be like, wait, 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 wait. Let's see how this Spider-Man Homecoming movie does. Let's see how the fans respond to it before we start connecting everything else in both these Well, here's the worlds. thing that Feige and Pascal said this past weekend. They confirmed that Spider-Man is going to be in these other films. It's just not part of the MCU it's that the MCU exists, Spider-Man's in it, but he can also be a part of these other. Well, films. see, no, I don't think that's the way it runs. I don't. I don't think he's he's going to be in those movies at all. From what the reports that I was reading, that he's not going to be in that. That it take that it takes place because the reports are that basically, it takes place in the same universe. Universe, but it's but you're never going to see those things blend over, and you're not going to see him in the movies at all. For the reports that I was. Reading. Well, look, the final yeah. authority on all this matter is going to be Christian's mother-in-law. What does she have to say? Who? Climbs the walls <laughs> when I'm sleeping. I hear things. You know, you know what's funny is that, like, I mean, with with whether or not there's Spider-Man in the MCU, and then if he comes over to Sony, but he's also in both. That's very comic bookish, and so <laughs> you can only have comic book movies for so long before the comic book element starts taking over the movie element. So it's very comic bookish. So. It could work. It's kind of like Eddie Brock with that Venom suit. It just starts to overtake your yeah. body. Oh. No more control. That's how you segue. Twitter questions. Wendy, we got a couple of them lined up? We got a couple of them lined up, and the first one comes from Archit, who writes, Hey, guys, Dunkirk is getting amazing reactions on Twitter. Seriously amazing. What are your expectations now? Seriously amazing are my <laughs> expectations. I mean, Christopher Nolan's directing it. It's a movie about a very pivotal moment in World War II, and I am over the moon about this flick. My only concern about Dunkirk is that they somehow give us a press screening before we all hightail it down to Comic-Con, because it comes out that weekend. Mm. And traditionally, it's been hard to get screenings of movies that open at Comic-Con. So if you're out there, if you're a PR rep for Dunkirk, send them our way, because we want to go see that. That movie, Christian. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm very excited to see it. As we know, Nolan is um, Nolan's one of the best in the world right now. If he's got to be in the top, what three or four directors working today, and I can't wait to see it. I'm very excited. Uh, I'm a World War II buff myself, so I want to see what's going to happen. I want to see how um, how he does it. I love the trailer so far, minus the extra. But I think uh, uh, other than that, uh, I'm ready to go. Sign me up. Snap, <laughs> Dunkirk thoughts. I think that extra is in a giant poster that I just saw. It's like yes, everybody it? having it. 
<laughs> There's one dude, and I was like, I think they highlighted that dude. But anyway, yeah, I just saw the most recent trailer that played in front of Baby Driver, and I cannot wait to see this film. So yeah, it's, it's a, I gotta see it immediately. JJ, it's Christopher Nolan, man. It's a, it's a cinematic event, and all of his movies, I like all of them in varying degrees of good to great. Uh, my only fear is that, like uh, Interstellar, the second and third viewing will be better than the first viewing. So maybe I'll watch it seven times before I actually mm. review it once. Who knows? <laughs> that is so true. Yeah, Interstellar is so much better the second and third time. Yeah. You watch it. Right. Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. It really all right. Is. Uh, Dark Knight Rises was not that way, but the Dark Knight yeah. Batman begins. Yeah. Two of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Nolan. We also like the prestige. <laughs> all right, what's up next? This next one comes from Blade GTR, who writes Since we're talking about Ready Player One, do you think or orchestral score or a movie's soundtrack plays more important? Oh, uh, man. I mean, uh, like, in, in, a score is kind of what makes the movie flow from one scene to another one. If it's a question of score or soundtrack, then I, I think it, it depends on the movie. Like, obviously, movies like Days and Confused are much more memorable or Wayne's World for the scores, for the, or for the soundtracks of the songs that were used in those movies. But I think for something like Ready Player One, which is video game-centric, I think the score is going to be the biggest player. Yeah, I mean, there are certain times that as long as the score and the, and the soundtrack fits the overall tone and feel and becomes a character in the movie. For example, there are t it's a soundtrack in Baby Driver, but mm -hmm. it's as much of a character as oh, yeah. Kevin Spacey is. Most um, so at Pulp Fiction, soundtrack really makes that movie what it is. But then there's a movie like I saw last night for the first time, and it's not a great movie. It's OK at best. It's Time Traveler's Wife, right? I watched it with my wife last night. And there's a score in there, and I want to find out who did the score. And it just it fit the tone and the feel and the emotion of it. It's just the score is more powerful with certain movies because it's it's when it's subtle, very right. some, similar to what you say about special effects, yeah. where you don't even realize that it's there, it's but invisible. It, it's just taking you through it and you feel it the same way you just would feel anything. The way someone, a certain actor, looks at somebody, it's that music playing in the background that is oh that's what I'm supposed to be feeling. That's why sometimes when it's a little jarring and the music like there's parts of Spider Man that I loved and there's parts of Spider Man that just it didn't fit. It was loud, it was bombastic, and it just it wasn't working because it's like trying to be dramatic and you don't need mm. to do it. But then there's other times when it just fits in beautifully and it's like, oh, okay, wait a minute, that's exactly what I feel and how that kid would be feeling and that's the emotion I got. That's a better way to do it in movies. Just don't have a dramatic score, just have a guy saying, trying to be time, yeah, trying character to be about bad. to die. This is scary. You start crying now. It is John scary. Schnapp. I'm feeling very emotional. Right. Um, <laughs> You know what the, the the biggest difference with for me is like if it's a genre specific type film, especially science fiction, I find that the soundtrack, the score, musical score is really important. Moon, I can na name off a bunch of films. Mark Ellis's favorite film, Blade Runner by Vangelis. Um, we'll see it before the movie I, we comes were out. Gonna it. We're gonna see it. I'm gonna make sure that we're gonna we'll see it together. We'll see it. I'll, I'll be um, drinking at Comic Con watching <laughs> Blade Runner. But you know, uh, Ready Player One uh, takes pl a lot of a lot of elements have that '80s theme. So I, I would be surprised if there aren't a lot of musical drops from the '80s in Ready Player One. So uh, Jeremy John scores soundtracks. Ready Player One. You have the final word on today's episode of Collider Movie Talk. Ooh, no pressure. I think scores and soundtracks, like you guys have said, depends on the movie and what they're going for. I think the scores are going to be very important. I then. Because Ready Player One is very video game centric, right? So that might be why Sylvester has that one, because I'm sure John Williams is like, in a world of blending video game and movies, I don't play video games. Right. I don't know his <laughs> gamer tag if right. he has one. So Sylvester might be the better guy to blend that world together. So just, I mean, things that dawn on me 45 minutes after we first talked about it. So I think it's going to be very important. I think they're both going to do a, uh, I think it's going to be a, a good thing. I think they're going to do a great job. Sylvester, pretty good blending of stuff when it comes to Forrest Gump or when it comes to Back to the Future. He had his great score and also Healy Lewis in the news. That's right. Giving us some all-time right. classics. Well, thank you guys for joining us here on Collider Movie Talk, a very Cake Frosting and Van Halen Cedric episode. Where can everybody find you, Mr. John Schnapp? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnapp, and later today on Collider Heroes. And every day this week on Collider Heroes for tasty little nuggets. Jeremy Johns, where can the kids check you out? Oh, you can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Twitter, rest of the internet. You can find my show, Awesome Tacular, on Go90, where I literally have pieces with all these guys here. Schnepp and I, we go comic book shopping. Harloff and I, we talk Star Wars. Mark Ellis and I, we throw pies in each other's faces. And as a guy who just had his birthday, Mark, being almost 40, you look like you're 30, you think like you're 20, and you act like you're 10. He did the reference! Yeah. But you are fun to play board games with. Does anybody get it? Write us right now. Christian Harloff. Nickelodeon? 
Nope. No. Uh, you can find me <laughs> at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. We mentioned also, you know, Heroes and, and the video game. We're going to have more information on that, so we'll just we'll post it up. Uh, I'll post it up on my Twitter account so you guys can get involved a little later today. And for everybody who watched a Collider Collision this past weekend, thank you so much. The amount of support that you guys have shown, um, all the comments, all the likes, everything. Some, so many people have shared it and been talking about it, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching and appreciate it. It was a slam-bang match. I would say some of the better matches we've ever had yeah. in the Schmodown took place this past Friday. Make sure you guys check out both parts one and two on the channel right now. Miss Ashley Mova, where can the kids find you? Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And Wendy Lee Zaney. Uh, Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. I am merely Mark Ellis. You guys can find me at Mark Ellis Live. Thank you to all of our crew. Thank you to everybody who came out and celebrated my birthday. It means a whole lot. Very excited to be captaining this movie talk ship Monday through Thursday. And Dennis is going to be back each and every Friday. I appreciate all the support, guys. Please let us know what you thought about today's episode of Movie Talk. We'll talk to you soon. I'm still working on my sign-off. <laughs> hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.